So welcome to another episode of Men Able Matters with me, Steve Witten. Now, the purpose of Men Able is really about getting people across the automotive industry to talk about mental health and to open up about their stories. Now, we know that that's particularly difficult in an automotive business if you are in a busy environment and perhaps you're carrying some stuff from your past or the life that's going on outside of work. And so today's guest, Adam Nichols, is going to open up about his story and tell us a bit about what's gone on for him and how he also now deals with the day-to-day -day stresses of life and working in an automotive business. So welcome to Men Able Matters, Adam Nichols. How are you, sir? I'm very well, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're more than welcome. So, Adam, in uh, good old fashioned Men Able Matters style, could you give us a bit of an intro as to who you are, where you're from and what you do? And, uh, and then we'll lead nicely into what you want to share about your story. Yeah, fine. So, yeah, Adam Nichols. Um, I'm the group recruitment manager for JCT 600. I've been for the company with them for coming up to seven years now. Um, 15 years um, in the recruitment industry. Um, different guises throughout my time. Um, I'm from Bristol, uh, live in Leeds now. Um, so yes, yeah, a little bit about me. Okay, cool. How did you end up living in Leeds from from Bristol? Then was that connected with the job, or there's always uh, a bit of long, story that people yeah, from one end of the country to the other. Yeah, long story. So I was born and raised in Bristol. I went travelling, came back, didn't want to live in Bristol anymore. Uh, I had friends in Leeds, so I moved to Leeds, got a job, um, met my partner, my fiance. Um, just as I met her, I ended up moving back to, to Bristol for a job. Um, and then she dragged me back up here 12 months later, and I've been here ever since. So uh, <laughs> in total, about 10 years, nearly 11 years. I've right, been up here. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, so you work in in the recruitment side of things for JCT 600. We know our right. one of the big family owned groups in the UK. Um, now, you shared with me a week or so ago a video that you um, did that did the rounds in the business. And you talk very, very openly about your history and your your past and the things that have caused issues and stress and so on for you. So. You know, and as much or as little of that as you want, just just give us a bit of an overview or insight into into well, firstly, what prompted that, and also what what the story is. I think that the main prompt from it, um, as a business, you know, the last eighteen months for everyone really has, has been a a real struggle um, and challenging for everyone. So as a business, we've we've done a lot around mental health. We've trained uh, mental health first aiders, me being one of them. Um, to really try and get the people in our company to be comfortable and looked after. Um, and, and we all know that mental health, yeah, people do bottle things up and there is this still this stigma around it. Um, and me personally, with the things that I've gone through, I thought a, a good way of trying to um, encourage people to start talking was to, to talk myself. Um, not many people do it, um, and I thought if I can do it, be very open and honest, um, it might encourage other people. So that was what prompted um, the interview that I ended up doing. Um, we shared it internally, it hasn't gone externally. Um, so, so that was what really drove that. Um, it was all organic, really. So Adam, would you say that, that you were guilty? No, I said guilty is a strong word, isn't it? But were you, you know, bottling things up as well? Did you keep stuff to yourself? Yeah, and I, I talk about it in the video, um, you know, I, I bottle things up for pretty much my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't start addressing things until I was in my mid thirties, you know, I'm 40 now, you know, so for me, definitely I bottle things up. Um, the, the phrase, and I say this in my video, is that um, the, the phrase man up and get on with it um, was a phrase which was said to me, um, countless amounts of times throughout my life yeah yeah i see that really doesn't help does it and and we both know that you know you've worked in recruitment and now in the car industry and those two industries yeah. you know can be quite tough really can't they and you know culturally that sort of man up type approach has has been pretty prolific really hasn't it yeah absolutely you know and you know recruitment is a very stressful high-paced um role to be in um my background is agency and I, I came internal 
but the automotive industry is just the same. It's extremely fast paced and you can almost kind of get lost in your day to day. Um, and you put what's going on inside to one side. Um, you know, and I was massively guilty of that and it, it, it ended up eating your life. Now, well, the, the and the irony, of course, is, you know, we talk about manning up and yet the reality is here you are now, 40 year old man, you know, starting to get your stuff together, I'm assuming. Um, and and so in order to have done that with what you've experienced, because I watched a video last week, you yeah. know, you, you have manned up. You, you've more than manned up, <laughs> you, you know, and and so I, it's interesting, isn't it? To think, well, what, what does someone else mean when they say man up? Do they actually mean just put a lid on it and don't talk about it? Yeah, and yeah. I think it's exactly that. And you think when they say man up, it's, you know, you've got your, your, your troubles and the things you think about and what's on your mind. Um, and I think that the phrase man up is kind of, well, you keep what's going on up here and in here to yourself. No one else needs to know about it. Um, and that ultimately in, in, in the first aid, uh, the mental health first aid that we do, you know, it talks about um, essentially we're a, a pot and it gets to a certain point. Everyone's a different size pot and it can overfill. And, you know, and it's, it's that, and you can keep it bottled up as long as you want, but at some points you're going to burst. Yeah. And everyone, everyone gets to that point at different stages. Now you work in a, talking of that, the, the pot, because I mean, that's an analogy that I've used a lot, but you work in a very supportive business. And I know that they've done a lot to, you know, spread the awareness of, of mental health uh, yeah. across the organization. Um, but you know, from your experience of the automotive industry and, and maybe recruitment as well, where you were before, what do you think sort of contributes to that keeping the lid on stuff or filling up the pot? You know, because that's the bit we're concerned about. Um, as you say, you know, there is this there has been this tendency of you know, just leave your troubles at the door. You're at work now. Um, but what I'm concerned about is what what's going on in terms of the culture and the working practices in our industry that contributes to, the, to that pot filling up. Yeah, um, and I think recruitment in terms of the industry and the automotive are very similar in that sense. It can be very male dominated. So with that, you still got the, the stigma around mental health and not talking about things, um, which is, is a very old mentality, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that is relatable to the automotive industry. We do know we're, a, we're st we are unfortunately still in a male dominated industry, extremely fast paced. And, and in some roles or most roles, I'd say it's it's high pressure as well. Mm. You know, so there is this thing, I think, and we're trying our best to, to, to fight against it. But everyone gets stuck into their day to day and to think about mental health as part of that day to day almost becomes a little bit too much because mm -hmm. you've got your targets to hit and your day-to-day -day roles, you've got your customers to look after. To add into that, looking after someone's mental well-being, um, historically, I think, has just been something which people are not comfortable with dealing with um, or don't want to deal with. Yeah, yeah. And know, ironically, and of course, if you do look after someone's mental well-being, they're probably more likely to hit their targets and achieve absolutely. the objectives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you said earlier, you know, it's it is a case of um, you know the the whole opening up, and we say man up and opening up. It's it's in my opinion harder to open up, but once you do it, the benefits are are there. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's just encouraging it. But our industry, we're, we're trying to catch up. I'm lucky. I work for a company which are very forward thinking in that sense. Um, I don't see it across the rest of the industry yet, but it's becoming a, a very big topic, which is good. We get, we're getting there very slowly, aren't we? With you know, we what we're doing and, and with people like yourself, you know, doing stuff as well. It's uh, we will get there eventually, but you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so to, to the context, um, could you tell us a little bit about your story then? Um, and, you know, I'm very conscious that I know it's, it's, you know some of it's really really traumatic so i don't want to uh, drag any of that up for you unless you're happy to talk about it but i think it'd be important to understand a bit of of where you're coming yeah. from adam yeah i won't go into all of it because it's quite a lengthy story so i'll give you a, a bit of a snapshot of all of it but essentially as i talked about my 
I bottled most of what happened to me up from pr pretty much my entire grown life until I started dealing with it. For me, it started you know, as a young child. Um, unfortunately, I experienced things within my family which were uh, extremely damaging, um, things that a young child shouldn't have had to experience. Um, that ultimately led up to our family completely splitting. I went with my dad, my mum went off. Um, my dad died when I was in my early 20s, suddenly. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, I'm 20, 24, um, still trying to gain kind of some understanding of being an adult and getting to grips with life. And my support just disappeared. I was completely on my own. Um, so that really uh, compounded all of my childhood stuff with the loss of my father um, in my mid-twenties. And I didn't really understand how to deal with it. I was on my own. Um, and it led me down a very, very dark path, which you know only got worse from that point on. Um, ultimately, it got to a... I wouldn't say it was a head because that wasn't really the point where I tipped, but in uh, New Year's Eve 2009 into 2010, um, I decided enough, enough was enough. Um, I was extremely lucky that I had a, a very good friend that figured out what I was doing and, and came and got me and pulled me off that bridge. Um, and at that point, I tried to help myself. Mm -hmm. I tried to go and see, see someone. It didn't work. I didn't like to do it because I was having to talk about the things that I was experiencing and I didn't like it. So I quit and I stopped. Um, that led me on to another, you know, fair few years of being internal and trying to deal with things in my head. Um, and it wasn't to the point where I was actually joined J JCT 600. Things came to another head again. Um, and I was encouraged uh, again to go and seek help. Um, both from an external point of view and from within the business. Um, and that's what really changed, changed me and, and really set me on the path to um, I guess, understanding myself uh, and feeling comfortable with myself. You know, I think there's this preconceived idea that you, you go in to see a counsellor or whoever it might be, a group, personal, individual, and it fixes you. It doesn't fix you. It helps you understand you yeah, yeah. and what's going on up here. Yeah. Um, and that kind of set me on my path to where I am now. So at, at what point in your journey then um, did you sort of open up about it? Uh, where you are in particular? Um, so I did uh, pretty in intensive counselling for close to two years. Mm. Um, I stopped three and a half years ago um, because it came to a natural end. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't talked openly uh, about all of this. Um, the video that I released was the first time that I've publicly spoke about me um and it's taken me this long to feel comfortable to be able to actually do it um but as i say my goal is that someone listens to this and either relates to it or at least gets encouragement that they can go and talk to someone yeah yeah now i was going to ask you earlier that um the key bit for me across the automotive industry is that you know opening up and talking about this stuff uh is one thing and we absolutely should be encouraging more and more people to do that. The challenge that I think we need to work on is ensuring that the people on the receiving end, the listeners, the, the managers, the leaders, whoever that might be that you open up to, have the empathy and the emotional intelligence to be able to deal with what they're hearing. And I, yeah. I don't mean turning them into counsellors because we don't want to do that. And we don't, as yeah. you said, we don't want to turn managers from people who are managing the performance of a business into psychotherapists suddenly. But there does need to be a level of, of empathy and, and emotional intelligence. And I mean, you're working in a supportive business, but what, what's your view of, of, you know, how much work we've got to do in that respect? Uh, and you're right, you know, even if you do mental health first aid, you're not a counsellor. You're not someone's professionally trained to deal with, with someone, but you are able to, to listen and to at least offer some guidance in terms of what someone might be able to do, even if you're just a listening ear. Mm. Um, 
but in terms of where we are as an industry um you know it, it's the awareness piece i think everyone needs to be made made more aware of um number one any key triggers or anything that you can see within someone that they might be struggling um but also the listening side of it is being that open ear and being um approachable you know uh, so many people could probably speak to their manager but don't feel that the manager is approachable in that sense or they still have this divide between personal life and and uh, your career or your professional life um you know i do think that you know we spend a huge percentage of our time at work you know so from a work perspective there needs to be that ability to be able to listen to someone Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of it comes down to educating our managers, um, even as simple as doing first aid, uh, mental health first aid. You know, just that simple understanding of how to listen to someone. Yeah, just just to be enlightened. I mean, you, yeah, you're you're spot on. I think if I if I think back over my career in the industry, you know, I've worked for a mixture of different managers and leaders over the years, and many of them have got to where they got to because they are fantastic operators. You know, they're very in tune with what the business needs and how to promote performance and so on. Um, but I honestly, you know, over a long period of time can can actually think of two or three managers that I would have approached in that period of time. Um, yeah. You know, and many that there's absolutely no way <laughs> would I have yeah. opened up. And I think that's that for me is the crux of the issue. Would you say that was the, that's been the same for you, Adam? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I can actually say, similar to you, there's only been two managers in my entire career that, um, number one, have cared, but have also been um, approachable enough to be actually able to talk to them. Mm. Um, And I think that's, you know, that's the main problem. It's making people approachable. Um, So, you know, from my point of view, managers, when they're training, there needs to be that aspect of mental health awareness within their training to become managers yeah yeah absolutely right and I, I so I do think yeah I, I agree with you I think it is about the you know the opening up of of the awareness and, and making people you know just generally aware and educating them on on emotional intelligence and, and empathy a little bit um, yeah not to detract from from their job but just encourage yeah. them because I actually yeah. think you know if you've if you've got to I know I'm a bit older than you but if you've got to our stage of life and you haven't experienced something that's rocked your mental health. You've been very, very lucky. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I'd agree. And I wonder if if that's perhaps what holds back some managers that they're actually, um, you know, keeping a lid on some issues themselves in a way. Yeah, um, and, you know, I'll go back to my analogy of the pot. You know, everyone's pot is a different size, mm. you know, and everyone gets triggered by different things you know so you might not have gone through any mass you know trauma trauma within your life uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't be empathetic empathetic um or at least be a good listener and be approachable yeah um you know we're we're all different all different things stress us out or don't stress us out so you know from from an individual's point of view if you're listening to this and you're feeling stressed or you're feeling um down you know go and find that person that is approachable. It might not necessarily be your manager. Um, ideally, you know, within our world, you know, managers are kind of that, um, that support structure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a case of finding someone that you feel comfortable talking to. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Now you mentioned, uh, again, don't want to overly take, take you back there, but you mentioned that your friend talked you down from the bridge. Um, what was that actually what happened? I mean, were you genuinely, you know, stood on this on a bridge somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, uh, and I remember it to this day it was Clifton Suspension Bridge. I, I lived in Clifton Village at the, at the point in Bristol. It was literally a two minute walk from my my house. Mm. Um, he noticed I was not right that night and uh, I disappeared. Wow. Okay, but he had the same um, sense or something in him said, yeah. reach out. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, he did. Um, unfortunately, we lost him four years ago, so losing him was a big thing for me. 
Um, but yeah, there's very few people I think in this world can say someone saved their life and he was one of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for opening up about that. I can obviously can sense how, how touching that is for you. And uh, yeah. I've got a cold shiver myself because I, I had a very similar experience. So which, you know, I think I've talked about before, but um, no, thank you for that. Um, and there was a reason for asking you about that because obviously yeah. you're now in the recruitment side of things in the automotive industry. And this has been something I've mulled over for a while. Um, and when I, when I said to you about at what point in your journey did you open up, did you, did you mention all of this at the interview? No. Um, and it's, it's a funny story for me, really, because my, my time throughout the business, you know, I've grown as an individual. I came in um, a complete closed book. Um, and my manager um, would probably say this, that um, for the first three or four years, she wouldn't have known me. She didn't know who I was. Right. So it, it was a deliberately loaded question. And the reason being is obviously you're, you're now specifically looking after recruitment for yep. GCT 600. And I'm yep. just picturing a scene where you've got, you know, we've, we've already talked about managers that perhaps need educating on awareness and empathy and emotional intelligence. Yeah. So I'm a sales manager that hasn't had that. And yep. I'm sat in my, you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I do. And I'm doing a whole <laughs> round of interviews for a sales exec's job. And there's one person whose CV stands out a mile. But when they come in, the first thing they say is the reason I'm leaving my current employer is because they don't look after my mental health. And I've got this, this and this going on. And I need to be somewhere where I'm looked after. Yeah. What firstly, what do you think is going to be the typical reaction? And secondly, how can we work with managers to get them beyond, you know, or get get you know get them in the right place for that? Yeah, I mean, if that does happen, um, you know, and again, I'm fortunate that we work for a business where we've got a very big infrastructure in place that can manage that. Mm. Um, but if you don't, it it is very much a case of you know. For me, for someone to open up like that in an interview, that's, that says a huge amount about that person's mm -hmm. uh, character. Um, and the fact that they can be that honest with you from the outset, um, again, from a character perspective, just says that that person is a very strong person yeah. and very comfortable where they are. But from a manager's perspective as well, you, you also know that you're going to have that aspect of, um, of that person to manage. And again, it comes down to the training. It comes down to being able to understand that some, some people, uh, and a lot of them, you know, as you said, there's very few people um, that go through life without having some mental impact on themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, you know, when we recruit, if that ever did happen, and I can't say that's personally ever happened to me, but um, if it did, you know, it's outlining what a business can do, um, you know, if they've got support structures in place. Um, but also from a manager's perspective is just being very aware of that person, regular updates, how are you getting on, being personable. Um, you know, as I said, work takes for such a big percentage of our, our life, but to split work and life and completely be separate to me is unrealistic. Yeah. Um, you have to be as a manager, um, interested in your employees well-being both professionally and personally yeah you know that's a very good point because for many years as a sales trainer i was trained people to be genuinely interested in their yeah. customers and we always used to say you know be interested to be interesting yeah. and I think what you've just touched on there is that that's a really good point actually you know managers and leaders need to be genuinely interested in the people around them yeah. to, to get the best out of them yeah yeah and you know I was guilty of this, but I very much separated my work and my personal life completely mm, mm. Um, to the extent where I was a completely different person inside of work. So I was outside. And the biggest thing that kind of released me in, in some ways is that I stopped that professional persona. I just became me. Mm -hmm. um, so from a manager's point of view, managing someone is really if you do think someone's holding that kind of barrier between personal and work life to try and break through that a little bit and understand what they do yeah. from a personal perspective 
Um, you know, I was lucky enough in, in my place now, I had a manager that was interested in that. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, you know, in, in the main across the industry, uh, that's a massive leap of faith for, for managers to, to become like that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, I have an example recently of somebody that I know who really was suffering with some mental health issues, you know, lots of stress, lots of anxiety, um, quite a depressed individual as well, with lots of yeah. trauma and a history going on with marriage breakups and so on. Um, was working in a car dealership, um, wasn't getting the best, uh, you know, sort of level of support. So he left, yeah. went for another job somewhere else. And the recruiting manager in that business, their priority was how many cars did you sell in your last month? Yeah. You know, now this individual could sit there and say, oh, I sold 25 cars. Um, but the reality of that was, well, actually, they didn't do anything to you know, manage that individual's um, mental health. And that was the, yeah. that was the, the driver of that individual moving jobs. Yeah. 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 And, you know, we, we all know if you're happy in what you do, you're good at what you do, mm -hmm. um, generally speaking. Um, so, you know, if you've got all these things going on in the background, you know, it, it does impact you do what you do on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. and your performance. So, you know, it, this is why I'm such a big advocate of, of mental health awareness is that you know from a business perspective you know if we can at least start making people understand it and talk then you're going to make a, a much happier workforce mm -hmm. um ultimately it becomes a better workforce i think yeah absolutely we're definitely on the same page adam i think so <laughs> yeah thank you so much for sharing your story with us today really really appreciate that and um you know we'll look forward to keeping in touch and having more conversations with you in the future i'm i'm sure so uh, yeah thanks for this steve brilliant thank you take care thanks